The Saudi attacks were supported by U.S. Marine artillery fire and air support. The Iraqi attacks near Kafji continued, and an Iraqi amphibious landing force was sent down the coast, aiming to cut off Kafji. It was caught out in the open by U.S. and British naval aircraft and largely destroyed. The fighting for Kafji itself lasted for 36 hours. The Saudis made repeated attacks against determined Iraqi resistance. Allied air power prevented the elements of the Iraqi 5th Mechanized Division inside Kafji from being reinforced. After house-to-house -house fighting, the Saudi forces were once again in control of Kafji. The Iraqis lost about 30 dead and more than 450 prisoners. They also lost over 100 armored vehicles in the border area alone. As the Allied forces began interrogating Iraqi prisoners, it soon became clear that Kafji had been intended as much more than a minor border skirmish. Saddam Hussein had planned the attack as a major offensive involving three of his best armored and mechanized divisions and about a quarter of his total tank strength in the Kuwait theater. The Allied bombing and artillery fire thoroughly disrupted his plans. Only one division managed to begin the attack on Kafji on time. The other two divisions began the attack 12 to 24 hours late. By that time, Allied strike aircraft were swarming over Kuwait, attacking anything that moved. Iraqi reinforcements intended for the Kafji battle were destroyed before they had a chance to move south. The battle at Kafji was an important turning point in the war. It clearly showed to coalition commanders that the Iraqis were incapable of conducting sustained operations in the face of Allied air superiority. It also clearly revealed that the average Iraqi infantryman, low on water and food and weary of the war, was unlikely to fight tenaciously. I think it was uh, extremely critical, number one, for the confidence and uh, for the morale of the Saudi forces. And in many respects, this was a Saudi victory with our support. The Iraqis, as you well know, are reputed to be the biggest and the best military in the Middle East. But this Saudi success has proven that they may no longer be the best, and many more defeats like this for the Iraqis, and they certainly will no longer be the biggest either. The importance of Kafji was not widely recognized at the time, but the performance of the Iraqi army made the coalition commanders confident that a ground offensive would go much more smoothly than they had originally anticipated. Our strategy to go after this army is very, very simple. First, we're going to cut it off, and then we're going to kill it. I'm not telegraphing anything. I just want everybody to know that we have a toolbox that's full of lots of tools, and I brought them all to the party. And the Schwarzkopf has them all at the party. By the third week of February, the first phase of Operation Desert Storm was complete. The Iraqi army had been cut off from its main source of supplies across the Euphrates River. Bridges had been bombed, and truck traffic had been halted by the air campaign. Iraqi divisions had been starved of food and water. A large number of their tanks, armored vehicles, and artillery had been smashed by air attack. Morale was low, and desertion rates were high. The capture of prisoners at Kafji from a good quality unit, the 5th Mechanized Division, gave senior American officers good insight into their opponents. There is might in sheer numbers. Saddam Hussein says he's going to win this through uh, will and experience. Uh, I strongly question the will of soldiers who are fighting because if they don't, uh, their families will be killed. Quite, a, quite unlike, for example, the Vietnamese who fought because they felt that they were right uh, and had personal conviction. They underwent the hardships and uh, fought despite of them, despite them, because they believed in what it was they were doing. Uh, I think all of us have reason to question whether or not the Iraqis really believe in what they're fighting for right now. Not that, not that they don't believe in their nation. And those of them that believe they're defending their nation uh, will fight hard. But the Iraqis are also smart soldiers. 
educational level in the uh, Iraqi army is pretty high. And I think uh, most of them re recognize the fact that that, uh, that they're fighting uh, through a combination of fear and, uh, uh, and for the wrong cause. The Iraqi forces in the Kuwait theater were deployed in a layered defense. Along the Kuwait-Saudi border was a line of entrenched infantry divisions. These were the most poorly equipped and poorly trained of the Iraqi forces. In the center of Kuwait were the tank and mechanized divisions. These were the best of the regular Iraqi army formations and had substantial numbers of tanks, infantry vehicles and artillery even after the air campaign. On the Kuwait-Iraqi border was the Republican Guard, widely felt to be the best troops and those most loyal to Saddam Hussein. So the, the defense the Iraqis put together was based on a model that they developed during the war with Iran, where you have infantry up in the front and fortification lines, basically cannon fodder to slow down an attacker. You then exploit that by counterattacking with your armored divisions, mechanized divisions in the immediate rear area. And then if you need, you bring in the Republican Guards for the really heavy duty offensive or, or, or defensive counter strikes. So this was a, about what we would have expected based on our experience watching the Iraqis during the war with Iran. The final plan for the ground offensive was extremely ambitious. Instead of a frontal assault directly into Kuwait, coalition forces used the indirect approach and exploited their own mobility advantages to strike where Iraqi defenses were weakest. Assignments were allotted carefully. The U.S. Marine Corps also kept a substantial force afloat in the Gulf as part of a ruse to convince Iraqi forces that they would be attacked by sea. We continued our heavy operations out in the sea because we wanted the Iraqis to continue to believe that we were going to conduct a massive amphibious operation in this area. And I think many of you recall the number of amphibious rehearsals we had to include imminent thunder that was written about quite extensively uh, for many reasons. But uh, we continued to have those operations because we wanted him to concentrate his forces, which he did. The first Marine Expeditionary Force, including the 1st and 2nd Marine Divisions, were given the task of pushing straight through Iraqi defenses and on to Kuwait City. The Marine Divisions fell between the Army's Light Airborne Divisions and the Heavy Maneuver Divisions in firepower and tactical mobility. In addition to their infantry battalions, the Marine Divisions each have three armored battalions. A tank battalion as its shock force, an amphibious assault battalion for mechanized transport of Marine units, and a light armored vehicle battalion for scouting and security. Compared to the Marines' three battalions, the Army's heavy maneuver divisions have 10 or 11 battalions, a mixture of M1 Abrams tank battalions and M2 Bradley mechanized infantry battalions. Due to the differences in the Army and Marine Divisions, General Schwarzkopf decided to deploy the Marines in the drive for Kuwait City, while the Army's more mobile divisions were assigned to the flanking attack. I think this is probably one of the most important parts of the entire briefing I could talk about. As you know, very early on, we took out the Iraqi Air Force. We knew that he had very, very limited reconnaissance means, and therefore, when we took out his Air Force, for all intents and purposes, we took out his ability to see what we were doing down here in Saudi Arabia. Once we had taken out his eyes, we did what could best be described as the Hail Mary play in football. I think you recall when the quarterback is desperate for a touchdown at the very end, what he does is he steps up behind the center and all of a sudden every single one of his receivers goes way out to, the, to one flank and they all run down the field as fast as they possibly can and into the end zone and he lobs the ball. In essence, that's what we did. When we knew that he couldn't see us anymore, we did a massive movement of troops all the way out to the west, to the extreme west, because at that time we knew that he was still fixed in this area with the vast majority of his forces, and once the air campaign started, he would be incapable of moving out to counter this move, even if he knew we made it. The Marine Drive was supported by the Coalition Arab Forces, including Egyptian, Syrian and Saudi units in Western Kuwait, and a Saudi and Kuwaiti task force along